Now their scriptures, their Bible, was what we call the Old Testament. And through these scriptures, God revealed to them his nature, his will, his plan. As the first note on the note sheets provided in the bulletin says, Through Moses, God gave the people his law. Through Moses, God gave the people his law. God told them how to live. Now, most of us are probably familiar with the Ten Commandments. Well, the law, God's law, went way beyond that. There were laws about how to plant your crops, what kinds of food you could and couldn't eat, what kinds of clothing you could and couldn't wear. Rules related to sexual conduct, religious ceremonies, personal hygiene, holidays and special events, various ethical concerns, and laws related to legal matters, such as the purchase of property, financial rules, assault, murder, divorce, immigration, capital punishment, and on and on. It wasn't quite as complex as the United States tax code. But you get the idea. Very complex. Now, by Jesus' time, the teachers of the, of the Jewish law had identified 613 different commandments in the law. 613. Now, we know from passages in the Gospels that Jesus himself was sometimes accused of disregarding the law. For example, Jesus would sometimes heal people on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the day of the week that according to the law you weren't supposed to do any work. And the teachers of the law said that by healing someone, Jesus was working on the Sabbath. Now Jesus didn't see it that way. He disagreed with them. But because of things like that, Jesus was sometimes accused of disregarding the law. But in Matthew 5, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes his attitude toward the law very clear. So please take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 5. That's page 683 and the Bible's provided in the pews. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Now we'll read a couple of verses now, but we're going to keep coming back to this passage. So through the sermon, just leave your Bibles open to this passage. Matthew 5, Jesus is teaching, and let's begin there in verse 17. Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus definitely does not disregard the law. In fact, he upholds and supports it. Jesus said that he's not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Now, part of what Jesus means by fulfilling the law is that he came to point us to the heart of it. As the people were trying to live out those 613 commands, many people had allowed the law to simply become a list of do's and don'ts. And they would be careful to obey the letter of the law even though they might have been totally missing the spirit of it. Throughout the rest of this chapter in Matthew 5, Jesus refers to six Old Testament commands and helps the people look past the surface of the command to the underlying principle behind it. For example, he begins by reminding them that the law says do not murder. The people thought they were obeying the command because they hadn't actually murdered anyone. And that's good. But Jesus said that even if they hated someone in their heart, that's still broken that command. They may have been obeying the letter of the law, but they were violating the spirit of it. Jesus said the same thing about other commands. For example, the law says, do not commit adultery. Jesus said 
that even if you don't, don't commit adultery physically, you still break that command if you just lust after someone else. So, as the note sheet says, part of how Jesus fulfilled the law was by calling us back to what the law was really all about. Part of how Jesus fulfilled the law was by calling us back to what the law was really all about. He takes us from the letter of the law to the spirit of it. Let's continue there in Matthew 5. Let's continue there in verse 19. Jesus said, Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments, these 613 commands, commandments, anyone who just breaks one of the least of these will be called little, will be called less, least in the kingdom of heaven. How are you doing in regard to living out God's commands? Those 613 commands. How am I doing? Have you been breaking the commandments God gives in his law? To keep it simple, let's just consider the Ten Commandments. I'd say most of us have at least heard of them, may even know them. The Ten Commandments are some of the foundational commands of God's law. The first of the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me, God tells us. Have you ever let something be more important to you than God is? At any point in your life? If so, then you've broken that commandment. How about the second of the Ten Commandments? You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Now, in our society, uh, people don't usually make idols out of wood and stone and bow down to them and worship them. But people violate this commandment all the time because many people still create their own God. For example, if I ignore what the Bible has to say about who God actually is and what the Bible says God wants and instead create my own version of God in my mind, a version of God that fits very well with my desires and my plans, the way things I think should be, then I've still broken that command. I've created my own God. I may be worshiping, I may be claiming to worship the God of the Bible, claiming to worship Jesus, but if it's Kevin Slamp's warped version of Jesus, if it's Kevin Slamp's version of Almighty God, which sounds ridiculous to put it that way, then I'm guilty of creating my own God instead of worshiping the God who actually is. What God are you worshiping? The third of the Ten Commandments, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Have you ever done that? I think we often tend to associate this command with uh, using God's name as a cuss word. And yeah, that's bad. And definitely that fits under this command, but this commandment goes beyond that. For example, have you ever used God's name in a meaningless or careless or disrespectful or trivial way? To use God's name in a meaningless way. For example, earlier this morning we were singing some songs. And occasionally in the songs we would sing the name of God. Whenever we're, we're singing... Do we ever think about, all right, what does this mean? Or, as I'm singing this name of Jesus, as I'm singing the name of God, am I not really paying any attention to it, but I'm actually thinking about the game that I can't wait to watch this afternoon? Or I'm thinking about all these other things that I need to do? Or maybe I'm even thinking about how this person down the pew has just driven me nuts. And I'm not even paying any attention. I, I'm just throwing God's name out of my mouth as if it's meaningless. Have you ever done that? The fourth command, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. Do we really observe the Sabbath? Do even 1% of Americans observe the Sabbath? The fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Have you ever in your life acted disrespectfully toward your parents. The sixth commandment, you shall not murder. Now like Jesus said, this includes hate. Have you ever hated someone even for a short period of time? Have you ever wished ill on someone else? The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus said that this includes lust. Have you ever lusted after anyone? We live in a culture that is drowning in sexual imagery. How about the Eighth Commandment? You shall not steal. Have you ever taken anything in your life that didn't belong to you? Ever taken something that didn't belong to you? And keep in mind, we're not just talking about stuff. This command, the commandment is referring to any time we take something that doesn't belong to us. For example, have you ever taken the credit for having done something good when truly the credit really belongs to someone else? Have you ever done that? The ninth commandment, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. Have you ever lied about someone else? Have you ever passed along damaging information about someone else when you weren't 100% sure that what you were saying was true? Have you ever gossiped? And the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet. Have you ever been envious of someone else? Do you ever want to have what someone else has? How did you do on this quiz? You know, you pull in the fish, and, and if there's a restriction on the, on the size, you know, the fish has to be a certain length. And you hold the ruler beside the fish. Okay, this one's a keeper. Oh, this one didn't measure up. Toss him back. Well, we do that with ourselves and with each other. Well, you know, how well do I measure up? Am I a keeper in God's eyes? Yeah, I think I'm doing pretty good. But the yardstick I'm using, if it's something of my own making or anyone else's making other than God's, then it's the wrong yardstick. We do, none of us measure up to what's the yardstick? The glory of God. That's the standard by which we will be judged. When it comes to judgment day, guys, I'm not going to be the one sitting on the throne. You don't have to worry about what I think. Sometimes people will be like, oh, what if the pastor finds out about this? Hey, you don't have to worry about what I think. I'm not qualified to judge. But there is a judge who is qualified. And it's God. And the standard that he will use will not be what I think is right and wrong. It's not going to be what you think is right and wrong. It's not going to be what the American people think is right and wrong. God doesn't care about polling data. It will be the standard that he uses to see whether someone is righteous or not is himself. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Who measures up to that? Not me. Not by a long shot. None of us can measure up to that no matter how hard we try. <laughs> but I think that just raises another question. If God knows that there's no way that we can fully obey his law, if he knows that, then why did he give us the law in the first place? Is he just playing games with us? Is he just setting us up to fail? Is God being cruel and I've talked to people who that's their perspective on it that if that stuff really came from God lots of times they'll just say well that didn't come from God God wouldn't be that unreasonable and what are they doing okay now I'll create God in my own image and worship that remember don't make for yourselves God but I've heard people yeah God's just being cruel if that really came from God God's crazy God's unreasonable God's being cruel 
and I understand where they're coming from. For example, let, let's put it in these terms. My daughter, Eliana, is four years old. For the past couple of years, she has been so into the Disney princesses. And most of the, our, the little play that I'll do with her, she'll be one of the princesses. And usually I'm the evil prince in the story. I don't know how that works out. I'm still holding out to be Prince Charming one of these days, but I've not risen to that yet. But she's into Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Elsa and Anna from Frozen. But for a long time, she was really into Cinderella. Cinderella was the gold standard of Disney princesses for my daughter. Well, what if I told her, Sweetie, we're going to take you to Disney World, where you can actually walk inside Cinderella's castle and meet Cinderella herself. For my daughter, that would be almost heaven. She would be bouncing off the walls. She probably would not sleep for days just thinking about this. She would be so excited. But what if I then said to her, but Eliana, hold on. There's something that you have to do if you're going to get to go to Disney World. And then what if I set before her stacks and stacks of coloring books, 100 coloring books, and then put before her you know, all sorts of crayons, one of those Crayola Crayon 64 packs, you know, the good stuff. What if I sat that before and I said, okay, honey, here's the thing. Before you can get to go to Disney World, you have to color every single page of these 100 coloring books, and you have to always choose to put the correct color in every single place, and you've got to always color it perfectly. Nothing outside the lines, always right inside the lines. And if you do that, you get that done, you get to go to Disney World. I can see my little girl in my mind now. I can see her. she would grab that first color book and she would take one of those crayons in her little fist and she would start going at it. And it wouldn't take long at all, but she would color outside the lines. And I have a pretty good, good idea how she would act in that situation. She would get so frustrated. She would try so hard, and she wouldn't be able to do it, and she would get so frustrated, and she would say, I can't do it. I can't do it. I want to go to Disney World anyway. That's what she'd do. Negotiation, you know. And what if when she did that, what if I replied, oh, I'm sorry, sweetie. Oh, I wish you could go. I do. I really wish you could go. But you see, honey, all of the colors at Disney World are perfect. All of the colors are just the right colors in just the right places. There are no colors where they're not supposed to be. Disney World, I mean, if you've been there, it's perfect. And so, honey, unless you're able to color all these books perfectly, you don't deserve to go to Disney World. Wouldn't that be cruel? How many of you would report me to social services if you knew that I did that? To, yeah. Well, is, is that what's going on? Doesn't it kind of seem that way? God has given us 613 commands, some of them so obscure. Some of them even that can be taken one or two different ways. And unless we get it just right, we're just sunk? Is God just being cruel with us? God, I want to know you. I want to live forever with you. I really do want to honor you with my life, even though I know I have it. I want to honor you with my life. But you've given me hundreds of rules, so many that I can hardly even remember them or learn them all. And if I break any of these rules in any way at any point, I'm done? That's it? I don't get to go to heaven if I just break one rule? I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't save myself. Did you hear that last sentence? What if God is not being cruel to us at all? What if God really is loving? You see, the law was not given to us so we could use it to save ourselves. God's law was given to us to teach us that we can't save ourselves 
no matter how hard we try. God gave us the law to bring us to a place of humility before him so we could accept this truth. We need a Savior. We need a Savior. Jesus, the Son of God, came to earth and he did live a sinless life. He's the only one who always colored inside the lines. He lived a life that none of us have been strong enough to, strong enough to live. Then he died on the cross for our sins, taking our sins on himself and paying for our sins with his death. God can now forgive us of our sins because God's justice has been served. His righteous requirements have been met by someone. Our sins have been paid for. Jesus died for our sins. God's justice, has, his righteousness has been satisfied. Then Jesus rose from the dead and lives forevermore, which means he can live in us and we can live in him. There's this holy amalgamation where we are gathered up in him. We live in Christ. Christ lives in us. And as he took our sin, we get to share in his righteousness. We get to share in his identity as a child of God because we're in him. We get to share his inheritance as the son of God. We are, the Bible talks about how we are adopted into the family of God in Christ. And he offers all of this to us. He shares his own righteousness. And the righteousness that we have then is not of our own making. We don't deserve it because we couldn't earn it. But by faith in Jesus, we receive righteousness given to us as a gift from God. You see, we need a Savior. Humanity has always needed a Savior. And here's something I need to make really clear. See, Jesus was not God's plan B for the world. Sometimes people mistakenly think that God originally tried to save the world by giving the law through Moses. And when that didn't work out, God had to come up with some other way to save us. So he sent Jesus. But that's not at all what happened. Jesus was always plan A. Even from the beginning. As a matter of fact, in Revelation, the last book of the Bible in chapter 13, it says that Jesus is the Lamb of God who was uh, slain, and it says, in quotes, before the foundation of the world. The Lamb of God slain for our sins before the foundation of the world. In other words, before any of this started. Before the earth was even created, Jesus was the plan. In other words, God's plan from the beginning was Jesus. But he's got to help us understand that we need him. That we need a savior. And if there's, if there's anything that will tick Americans off these days, you tell somebody that morally they don't measure up. They'll get all bent out of shape. Who do you think you are? It's my life. I can live however I want to. I have rights. Da, da, da. We don't. Part of the reason it's so hard to evangelize people in the United States today is because they don't think they need to be saved. And how are you going to be thankful for Jesus as a Savior? How are you going to be able to sing about God's amazing grace? That grace doesn't seem all that amazing if you don't think you need it. It's not amazing grace. It's the well-intentioned, we really appreciate it, but don't really need it grace. It's the gift, you know, that your in-laws give you at Christmas, which was a nice thought, but you know where that's going. Do you, do you and I accept our own need for a Savior? Are we willing to humble ourselves? That's really what it's about. No, I'm not. I am not anyone who measures up to the glory of God by any stretch of the imagination. I need a Savior. If I don't have a Savior, I, I don't have hope. I don't have a chance. Who is going to trust in Jesus as their Savior if they're not convinced they need to be saved in the first place? So, as the note sheet says, God gave us the law to convince us of our need for a Savior. That's the point. And guys, this isn't my idea. It's not like I came up with this. The Apostle Paul teaches this. In, in Galatians chapter 3, he says this. Paul writes, Before this faith came, he's talking about faith in Jesus. Before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law. Locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ 
that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. He says the whole point of the law was to lead us to Jesus. That's the next note on the note sheet. The true purpose of the law was to point us to Jesus. That's the point. Again, Paul explaining this in Romans 3. Paul writes this. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for our sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. This is good news. Hopefully, now you know what Jesus meant when in the Sermon on the Mount he said this. We read this earlier, Matthew 5, 17. Jesus said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I'm not, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The true purpose of the law was to point us to Jesus. So, having said all this, let me ask you. Are you trusting in Jesus to save you? Or are you trusting in the law? Which is another way of asking, are you trusting in yourself? Your own ability to live out the law. Have you been laboring under the lie that it is your own good deeds that will determine whether or not you get to heaven? Because if that's your plan, it ain't going to work. None of us have a shot on that basis. Maybe you've been trying so hard to be good enough for God. And so for some people, this really stresses them out. And understandably so. They're the people who actually take it seriously. Maybe you've been trying so hard to be good enough for God, all the while knowing that you never quite measure up. But this morning... In light of the good news of Jesus Christ, what we went through this morning, are you willing to lay that burden down? To come humbly before God and admit, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't save myself. Are you willing to put your faith, that is your wholehearted trust, in Jesus and Jesus alone as your Savior? to ask him to forgive you of your sins, to come and live in you and allow you to live in him. That's how salvation begins. And salvation is the continuation of that relationship with God throughout eternity. It starts now and we just continue to learn to love God more and more, to learn to love each other better and better as we walk in relationship with him, him living inside of us. And all of that begins not by earning it through works, but by humbly trusting in him in faith. Jesus, my faith is in you, in your good works, not in mine. I'm going to do my best to live out good works for you, not because I'm trying to earn anything, but because I love you. And I want to honor you with my life, so I will do my best to do good works, but I will do it while being in the joy of knowing that my salvation is secured, not because of Kevin Slint, but because of you, the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Salvation begins with us recognizing that we need a Savior. We need Jesus. Have you accepted Him? Have you put your faith, your trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior? Have you surrendered your life to Him? Have you said, okay, I, I, I don't want to dishonor you by rejecting who you are, God, with all my sin and rebellion, my stubbornness against you? who you are and what you want. I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to come before you and say, I'm yours. I'm going to put my faith in you and say, I am, I am completely putting all my hope that you are the one who is going to save me because you know, God knows, I can't save myself. Have you done that?
Because if you haven't, now's the time. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Right here, right now, Jesus said where two or three are gathered in my name, I am right there in their midst. Jesus, Jesus himself is here. And if you sincerely speak to him and say, yes, I want to know you. Please forgive me of my sin. Come and live inside of me. He will hear you and he will do it. He did it for me. He did it for all sorts of folks in here. We know from experience this is true. This can be your day. And if you're ready to receive him, I'll be waiting at the front if you want to come and, and pray with me about it or the associate pastors, they'll be on either side. Is today the day that you fulfill your destiny as a human being to come into relationship with your creator who loves you more than I could ever explain? Would you please stand and let's pray.